Closing arguments begin Tuesday in Trump's criminal trial in New York. Now, the jury will then get the instructions here from Judge Juan Marchand. Now, that's the same judge who put a gag order on Trump. He threatened to throw a defense witness off the stand. And it's the same guy who would let a federal elections commissioner testify about what is an illegal campaign violation. Remember, that's what Trump is tied to this charge is all about. He wouldn't let him testify. So what can we expect from the jury instructions this week? Is he going to be biased? Is he going to be fair? Let's bring in some attorneys here to talk about that. Trump attorney Jesse Benal and criminal defense attorney Bradford Cohen joins me. Uh, Jesse, we heard this both sides last week arguing to the judge about these jury instructions because they're super important. This is what they will be deliberating over. Prosecution wanted to include unlawful intent in the language and the defense wanted to include the words willful intent. Uh, explain to our viewers the difference and why is this so, so important in how they're gonna come to a verdict? Yeah, that's a great question because it's very, very important. If you are accused of violating federal election uh, campaign laws, then the government has to prove, the prosecutors have to prove that you willfully violated the law. And that actually means that you knew what the law was and then still decided to violate it, which, uh, of course, we've all grown up hearing that ignorance of the law is, is no excuse. Normally, that's true, but not when the required intent level is willfulness. And that is what the law is. Um, and the judge is is refusing to go along uh, with what the law is in, um, in issuing a willfulness instruction so far. Uh, I hope he changes his mind, but that's uh, so far, he's shown um, really a, a disregard for the law in the instructions that he's uh, approved so far. Matter of fact, he's actually said he doesn't want to give accurate jury instructions on the state of the law because it would be too confusing to the jury. Um, and uh, it's really, really uh, one of the most bizarre and ridiculous things I've ever seen from a judge uh, to to go as far as, as he's gone so far for putting his thumb on the scale on jury instructions to try to hamper President uh, Trump's uh, chance of, of getting a, a fair jury deliberation, uh, just like he's tried to hamper President Trump's uh, chances of getting a fair trial. That's a good point, because that's what it boils down to, Bradford, is that all of this time we've seen this bias from him, whether it be not allowing people to testify, the gag order is another example of that. But when it comes down to this, I mean, he's the he ultimately will decide what the jury has to determine if the former president is guilty or not. Are we going to see more bias in terms of what that jury instruction is going to be? Certainly, if you look at his past uh, performance, you would expect to see some more bias here. It's it's really shocking. A lot of the uh, decisions that this judge has made, uh, including excluding evidence and including evidence that probably shouldn't have been included in this case. It's an unusual, really, really unusual case in terms of the decisions that have been made where you see the leaning is so far towards the prosecution that it opens the door to an extreme appeal. Uh, and everybody, even, even if you're very far left, you're still thinking that there's probably gonna be an appeal here and the appeal, if, it, if in, indeed he's convicted, and the appeal's gonna be successful just because of the, the past rulings that this judge has made. It's really one of those things where he went out of his way actually went out of his way to include evidence that shouldn't have been included mm -hmm. and exclude evidence that most experts will tell you shouldn't have been uh, shouldn't been uh, thrown out. It's really unusual. Jesse, uh, the prosecution has a weak case here. I mean, we've heard all kinds of legal experts, both left, right, doesn't matter the network. They're all saying that this is a weak case. So is the DA's office trying to salvage this case in the closing arguments, but also with the jury instruction, can they salvage a case out of this? Well, that's exactly what they're trying to do, and that's what Judge Mershon is is trying to help them do. So, for instance, you know, there never was any legal basis for this case, and you're exactly right that when it, it comes to some of the issues at play here, it would have been absolutely appropriate to have uh, uh, the chairman, former chairman of the Federal Election Commission, Bradley Smith, testify at trial, but the judge refused to do that. Instead, what he did is he let Michael Cohen testify as to what uh, the, the effect of the Federal Election Campaign Act, a lawyer who didn't camp, uh, ever practice campaign finance law and who has been disbarred. And so the answer is yes, they are going to try to do everything they can in order to uh, take a, a, a 
case that has never had any basis in law, in fact, and just try to make this about personalities for the jury. So the jury, uh, they can they can try to uh, get the jury to convict President Trump because they may not like him politically. That's been the only way that they could win from the beginning. And the mm-hmm. only other way they could they could win from the beginning is a judge who wasn't acting appropriately or fairly. And they got that in Juan Marchand. Bradford, how can they make this simple for the jury? I- I've been covering this for six weeks. I've been sitting in the courtroom and outside the courtroom. It's confusing to me. And I can imagine that they've been listening to all of this testimony, all these different witness accounts. How are they going to simplify this for the jury to the point where they can ultimately make the right decision here? So there's a couple, it's a good point. There's a couple different things going on. Number one is there's two lawyers that are on the jury. So in terms of that, normally we never want lawyers on a jury because, you know, when you have lawyers on a jury, they overthink things, they they analyze things too much. In this case, it's probably better for the defense to have two lawyers on the jury. That's kind of the first mm. portion of this. The second portion of this is I would focus really, I'd narrow my focus. I'd focus is on the, the greatest liar of all time, Michael Cohen. It, it is an amazing, Amazing, amazing fact that they put him on the stand, that he continued to lie, that he then admitted to stealing from the from the Trump organization, all these different things that no one would ever touch. No prosecutor would ever put this individual on the stand. And I make a big joke about this. The only time you can believe a convicted felon when he takes the stand is when he's testifying for the state. That's number one. So I would make that argument in closing. I would say you, there's nothing you can believe from him. If you believe, if you don't believe one thing, you shouldn't believe anything. It's a, you know, Mark Furman knows this in the O.J. Simpson case. The second thing I would hammer on is where is the crime? What is the crime here? What are they identifying as the crime? How are they identifying it? What is the willfulness of that crime? Now, again, you're going to back the judge is going to try and backdoor and say, no, this isn't a willful. This isn't a willful type situation, which, again, it just begs for an appeal. But I would make that argument in closing. I'd make it very simple, and I'd base it around the lying Michael Cohen, the crime that was not committed, and also the reasonable doubt as to why the payment was allegedly made. And that could have been because he was embarrassed about his family, because of all these different things that could have come up. So give them that alternate route to say, hey, listen, even if you do believe this guy who is a complete liar, even if you believe him, you have to believe there's reasonable doubt on why this payment was made. I'll leave it with this, too. As Michael Cohen was getting reimbursed for the money that he paid Stormy Daniels, he was stealing from the Trump organization. <laughs> Is that not enough right there? All right, yeah. I'll leave it here. Uh, Jesse Benal, Bradford Cohen, thank you so much. That was great.